thank you again, Jean. Um, now it's time for our second panel. This panel focuses on two of the most important issues facing us individuals, as individuals in the society, and the title captures the dilemma perfectly, restoring personal privacy without compromising national security, or security in general, actually. Our moderator is the department chair and Grace Murray Hopper Professor of Computer Science at Yale University. Please welcome Joan Feigenbaum and her panel. Good morning. The panelists and the moderator in this session are members of the cryptography, security, and privacy research communities. And our communities currently have a lot to answer for. Russian hackers are said to have disrupted the 2016 US election. Russian hackers supposedly have plans to disrupt the next German election. And Angela Merkel said that she thinks the German military should hack back. During the last three months, so-called homegrown terrorists have killed many innocent people on four different occasions in the UK. And supposedly some of these terrorists were radicalized in online meeting places using encryption, encrypted communication tools. Theresa May says that the UK security services should stop proto-terrorists from meeting in secret online, even if they have to trample on UK citizens' civil liberties in order to do so. Google, Facebook, Wikipedia, and other internet companies have announced concerted efforts to combat fake news with human editors, third-party fact-checkers, and more attention paid to user feedback. But it's not clear that these efforts are working. So these are just some of the episodes, the latest episodes, in the long-running soap opera about online security and privacy, or usually the lack thereof. Earlier episodes included the Snowden revelations, Chelsea Manning's disclosure of classified documents to WikiLeaks, Intrusion into the computer systems of the US Office of Personnel Management, supposedly by Chinese hackers who were masters of social engineering, and exfiltration of intellectual property and embarrassing personal information from Sony's computer systems, supposedly by North Korean hackers using a server message block worm tool. The cryptography, security, and privacy research communities have much to offer in the fight against hackers, intruders, and other online miscreants. Contrary to what some people in law enforcement and intelligence seem to think, however, we're not magicians. We can't always tell them instantaneously how to hide whatever they want hidden from the bad guys and how to break into whatever hiding places they think the bad guys are using. So what can we do? That's the question that our distinguished panelists will address in this session. So we'll start with brief bios of the panelists and then brief introductory remarks by each of them. Next, I'll ask them some open-ended questions that I hope will elicit agreement on some issues and principal disagreement on some other issues. And then, of course, we'll take questions from you. So. Um, I guess that's your left to right. Whitfield Diffie is best known for discovering the concept of public key cryptography, which underlies the security of internet commerce and all modern secure communication systems. He received the ACM AM Touring Award in 2015 and was elected to the National Academy of Engineering in 2017. Uh, From 1991 to 2009, he was with Sun Microsystems where he served as Vice President, Sun Fellow, and Chief Security Officer. After leaving Sun, he worked primarily as an advisor to innovative startups in the security field. Since 1993, Diffie has focused on public policy in the areas of cryptography, security, and privacy. 
He opposes limitations on the business and personal use of cryptography. And his position has been the subject of articles in the New York Times Magazine, Wired and Discover, and of programs on CNN, Discovery Channel, and Equinox TV. Paul Syverson is an inventor of onion routing and a creator of Tor. He holds multiple advanced degrees in philosophy and mathematics, has authored one book and more than 100 refereed papers, and has chaired many security and privacy conferences. Syverson is a founder of the, security, of the Privacy Enhancing Technologies Symposium and the ACM Workshop on Privacy in the Electronic Society. He's an Electronic Frontier Foundation pioneer and an ACM fellow. During his decades as a mathematician at the US Naval Research Laboratory, he's also been a visiting scholar at institutions in the US and Europe. Brian Ford leads the Decentralized Distributed Systems Lab at the Swiss Federal Institute of Technology in Lausanne, better known as EPFL. He focuses broadly on building secure decentralized systems, touching on such topics as private and anonymous communication technologies, internet architecture, and secure operating systems. Ford received the J. LaPro Best Paper Award at the USENIX Symposium on Operating Systems Design and Implementation, and has had many grants from NSF, DARPA, and ONR, including the NSF Career Award. His pedagogical achievements include PIOS, the first operating systems course that leads students through the development of a working native multiprocessor OS kernel. Ford earned his BS at the University of Utah in his PhD at MIT. He joined the Yale faculty in 2009 and was promoted to tenured associate professor before moving to EPFL in 2015 and breaking my heart. <laughs> um, I was, just became chair at that time. Um, Nadia Henninger is an assistant professor in the computer and information science department at the University of Pennsylvania where her research focuses on applied cryptography and security, particularly cryptanalysis of deployed public key cryptography. She received an NSF Career Award in 2017, Best Paper Awards at the ACM Conference on Computer and Communication Security in 2015 and 2016, and at the USENIX Security Conference in 2012, and she received the Best Student Paper Award at the USENIX Security Conference in 2008. Henninger received her PhD in Computer Science in 2011 from Princeton, and her BS in Electrical, en electrical Engineering and Computer Science in 2004 from UC Berkeley. Before joining the Penn faculty, she was an NSF Mathematical Sciences postdoctoral fellow at UCSD and a visiting researcher at Microsoft Research New England. So we will now have brief opening remarks by the panelists, which will tell you something about how they approach this very broad topic. Rick. Well, let me start by saying I talk on terms of copyleft. If you're perceiving this presentation, you're entitled to copy it. And if you have a copy, you're entitled to redistribute it under the same terms. I think that talking about a conflict between security and privacy is a misunderstanding of priorities in this area. What we're really talking about <clears throat> is different aspects of security, in particular the national security. And in this, we have a problem that goes back to feudalism the right to what was called crenellate and fortify, the right to build a castle, was granted by the king because a castle added to the national security, and it, it participated in defense of the, of the realm, but it also had power, could be used to oppose the will of the king. And we see basically that is what the government is finding now, except that, you know, a castle's a big thing and we have applies to all sorts of little tiny things. And it upsets 
a long-standing basic notion that you're responsible for your security at the, at the level of locking your door, but you know the king's army is responsible for protecting you from foreign invaders. I think it's become particularly clear this last year or so that the governments are not only not capable of protecting the cyber security of their citizens, they are not capable of protecting themselves. And so it falls to individuals, to companies, to groups to have whatever security they can manage to protect their data, their processes from, from invaders. And the problem is, right, what now the government says, well, that's sort of all right, but in exceptional circumstances, we would like to be able to get in. We would not like you to be able to protect yourself from our legitimate court system, et cetera. The difficulty is that we can barely convince ourselves of the security of the simplest processes. Cryptographic algorithms are tiny programs, a few thousand lines, a few thousand bytes, and yet they are broken typically not in recent years by breaking the crypto mathematics, but they are broken by failures of implementation. And to add a mechanism for exceptional access to every security system is to make it more complicated. And <clears throat> the real risk today, it hasn't much been seen, I think there's ample reason to believe it, the threat is there, is that the vital national critical infrastructure will be attacked, that generators will be destroyed, that banking systems will be subverted, that, that transportation will be stopped. That that protecting ourselves against that depends on having secure systems, and we should put that effort ahead of everything else. And it is possible that in a few years we'll understand much better how to write reliable programs, and that at that point, it will probably, it may be the time to consider whether some sort of exceptional access is needed. And in the meantime, the fact is that the security failures of most programs give the government ample chance to break in itself. Thank you. Thanks, Whit. So uh, the first thing I want to do is, is uh, underscore uh, our, some of our major points of concern. So. Uh, specifically, we're talking about significant national security threats uh, coupled with technological innovation that raises questions about the ability of authorities to confound those threats. And um, I'm, of course, speaking about the increased wide-scale adoption of the printing press in 17th century England uh, at the time of the English Civil Wars. There was a huge increase in the amount of written material that was out there that was being produced and also transmitted that was just outside the scope of official scrutiny, and this was a big concern. Um, attempts to cope with this included the proclamation of 1635 that made it illegal for any but state messengers to carry letters under threat of, quote, severe exemplary punishment. Uh, and uh, Ro uh, Roger Lestrange, who was Charles I's uh, chief censor in his uh, 1663 treatise that spelled out uh, how the press should be regulated and how it should be formed, specifically required that, quote, no printing house be permitted with a back door to it. So um, the first point is that uh, the specifics are novel, but the general topic of the authority's abilities to control or even just observe what citizens are saying or hearing is not new with end-to-end -end encryption or even the web or even the telegraph. This is an issue which we've been wrestling with for a long time. The second point is that this dichotomy that we're generally presented with, and it's even in our title, of uh, privacy versus security is, I think, uh, uh, just a misconstrual of an actual dichotomy, which is between uh, a, a perspective of pr protection and investigation. Now, once you have already accepted the investigative perspective, then security and privacy are potentially in some tension, security is measured by the power 
of uh, investigative capabilities and privacy by the limits on gathering and use of information. Um, I think you're going to hear more about that from perhaps Brian. Uh, but from a technological perspective, uh, an adversary is anybody who can try to circumvent the system's uh, protections. And that's whether the compromise is intended against security or privacy. Uh, so the distinction just doesn't matter on a technological level. And it also doesn't matter whether that adversary is a criminal or a lawful authority from government or an authority from some opposing government. Um, when you're looking at the technology of security, anyone engaged in such circumvention is, is an adversary. Uh, and in this context, we could help by improving the prospects for users, whether they're individuals, businesses, uh, or government authorities, to securely access public or shared information and to manage who does get to learn uh, or alter their data or their metadata. Um, as an existing example, by making systems for them to connect and chat uh, or visit a website without leaking to cell towers, uh, internet routers, or other parts of the infrastructure, who's talking to whom or what they're saying. Maybe Paul had the right idea. <clears throat> I'm not sure this is laptop compatible. OK. So we now live in a world in which the rules coded into technology we use play as important a role in governing our lives as the formal laws written in public books. Code is law already, for better or worse. Unfortunately, both the technology and policy commu community still overall tend to treat technology as a simple set of tools, like a mechanical watch, home appliance, or automobile, which always unquestionably serves its operator. Now, a uh, smartwatch or home appliance can monitor our behavior and report it to companies or governments, can enforce remotely controlled rules deter determining when and how it operates, and can remotely determine what content we are allowed to view or when and for whom the smart lock on a door to our own homes will open. Today's cars can already be remotely disabled or attacked and soon will be capable of governing uh, where we can go and when. Technology is no longer just a set of obedient tools, but from, for better or worse, also an inherent part of the system of governance that determines what individual freedoms we do and don't have. Unfortunately, the mindset of technology as an obedient tool set has led both government, government and industry to deploy technology in ways that undermine long-standing governance principles and undermine the basic freedoms and rights we depend on democratic governments to uphold. Principles such as rule of law, separation of powers, and limited warrant-based search. The principle of rule of law states that the public should have the right to know, debate, and challenge the rules that govern our lives. As technology is increasingly critical in enforcing the rules by which we live, we must demand and work to ensure that the rule of law principle translate properly into the digital domain. We, have now, we now have well understood technology, especially cryptographic tools, that can help ensure the integrity and correctness of publicly known processes while keeping sensitive details private, consistent with rule of law principles. But so far we have seen little actual deployment or development of these technologies for this purpose. Instead, we've seen law enforcement and surveillance agencies shifting power ever deeper into the shadows. Ed Snowden and other whistleblowers casted much, cast much needed light into the proliferating, uh, proliferating morass of secret law, embodied not only formally in the secret proceedings of bodies such as the FISA court, but also the de facto secret law embedded in, in secret man, mass surveillance technologies, secret stockpiles of software exploits, and the secret agency internal processes that purportedly govern their use. The secrecy and non-transparency of these processes are antithetical to, to democracy and rule of law, whether embodied in secret FISA decisions or in code and databases designed and deployed in secret by three-letter agencies. Separation of powers is intended to pre prevent any branch of government from acquiring too much un unaccountable power. We also have well understood technology to split trust across multiple, indep multiple independently operated authorities, such as Byzantine consensus and threshold cryptography invented by many of the eminent people in this room. But again, this is rarely used. In the dumb tool mindset, government deploys technology largely in the domain of the executive branch. Only that one branch effectively has uh, any understanding of, let alone control over, the deep technological rules and processes 
that determine what protections we do and don't have from law enforcement and surveillance. Legislative and judicial oversight merely become a fig leaf along with the whole principle of separation of powers when no one in the le legislature or judiciary, judiciary actually has any understanding of or control over deep technology systems and processes deployed exclusively in the executive branch. Finally, our fourth and fifth amendments are intended to impose strict limits on government searches or law enforcement for surveillance purposes, recognizing that it is more important to have democratic freedoms to defend than to catch every last criminal. But the, complete, but the obsolete mindset of technology as, a, as dumb tools has led many policy makers to underestimate the centrality of personal devices in our lives. Some policy makers treat personal devices, such as laptops and smartphones and the encrypted data they contain, as mere possessions similar to con the contents of one's home and claim that law enforcement is somehow ent entitled to access to these devices. This unfortunately neglects the reality that we now carry personal devices with us everywhere, using them as extensions of our thoughts and memories and to intermediate, intermediate our most intimate co communications. While the possessions in our home have Fourth Amendment protections against unreasonable search and se seizure, I would claim that the contents of our minds also have or should have Fifth Amendment protections against self-incrimination. Even if I remember committing a, uh, even if I committed a crime and remember committing a crime, the government cannot force me to admit it, even with a warrant. That is, under human rights principles, my mind is a legi legitimate warrant-proof space. Now that we rely on mobile personal devices to help us remember and communicate wherever we go, they have effectively become extensions of our minds and bodies, and as wearables and implants proliferate, they will become only more so. We must recognize that our Fifth Amendment protections are not complete or effective today unless they extend the warrant-proof space of our minds to the electronic extensions embodied in our personal devices. There's no pure technology solution divorced from policy, but there's also no pure policy solution divorced from the reality of technology as a de facto policy, policy enforcement mechanism. We must intelligently integrate technology and policy to restore the trustworthiness of democratic processes, rights, and freedoms in the digital age. Again, we have the to technology tools to accomplish this, but we must use them. Research on this topic that Joan and I and others have worked on has demonstrated uh, uh, in principle, how technology can be married with policy principles for some proven law enforcement pro processes, such as pri private set intersection of cell tower dumps or privacy preserving contact chaining. We can and, and need to design technology to uphold rule of law by transparently enforcing public processes while keeping details of investigations and, and non-targeted users private. We can and must design technology to enforce separation of powers such that systems independently operated by each branch and keep, uh, keep each other in, in check in implementing electronic law enforcement and surveillance processes. We must work to ensure that technology used in law enforcement and surveillance verifiably adheres to the strict limits the Fourth Amendment allows for search of ordinary possessions and business records. Finally, our law enforcement and surveillance technologies must respect, respect the contents of our electronically, uh, electronically augmented minds as, le as legitimate warrant-proof spaces essential to upholding our freedoms of thought, speech, and association. In summary, we must discard the obsolete mindset of technology as merely a set of dumb tools and recognize that technology has become, for better or worse, an integral part of our system of governance that determines what rights and freedoms we all do and don't have. Technologists need to recognize this and work closely with the policy community to ensure that the policy principles underlying our basic individual freedoms are not lost in translation to digital society. Great. In the debate between standing and sitting, I went for standing. So uh, I want to start by sort of expanding a little bit on the relationship between tools and policy that Brian was talking about. And in particular, in this kind of audience, it's a little bit dangerous to get sucked into thinking about technical solutions to political problems. And this is a phrasing that I stole from some policy debates. Um, technological tools live in a social, cultural, and policy context that ultimately determines how they're used. Um, to make this a little bit more concrete, I want to give sort of a simple example that I think is due to Bruce Schneier. Uh, so your house has a lock on the door, but this lock is not really the thing that keeps people from breaking and entering your house and stealing all your stuff. 
Um, this lock is actually mostly a symbolic barrier uh, inside of this cultural and economic and political system that deters the vast majority of people from trying to enter your home in the first place, unless they're invited in. Um, and basically what the lock is doing is raising the cost of entering your house against the small fraction of people whose incentives are different from this you know, social system that we're living in. And you know, the sort of economic argument is that if you know how to break a lock, uh, you can probably make a better living as a locksmith or a security professional than you can by breaking into people's houses. Um, so, you know, in grad school, I didn't lock my front door for years because my housemate couldn't carry a key without losing it. And this was fine because I lived in a privileged little university town where nothing bad ever happened, really. Um, then I went into security and, and my life changed. So, <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you know, this is brought up, uh, you know, many times uh, basically by everybody. We can't really divorce the debates around security versus privacy from the political and legal system that we're living in right now. So to make this concrete, we're living in a system where the US government can illegally wiretap internet traffic crossing AT&T in secret, and the courts can determine that nobody has legal standing to sue and everybody involved is retroactively given immunity. We're living in a system where a secret court can issue secret orders requiring Verizon to turn over all call records for all customers for years, and these orders were publicized in the Snowden leaks, and the government responded by declassifying the continuing surveillance orders. Nothing else happened. We're living in a system where the NSA can surreptitiously design a backdoor cryptography standard, as far as we can tell, and then pay unwitting customers to, uh, companies to use it in their products that are given to customers. And nothing else happened. Um, it's hard to have a real democratic debate about the technical aspects of surveillance without more transparency to understand what's actually happening. This is a problem for everybody in the open technology community in, in security. Uh, for private companies, there are few legal requirements and almost no economic incentives for companies to be more transparent to, to consumers about their security and privacy. We're seeing more movement in that direction, but it's, it's like a very long and slow road. Um, I spent most of my career so far finding ways to break deployed cryptography in practice. Um, as Whit mentioned, um, you know, this is really fun and sexy work, but the vulnerabilities are not in the mathematics. Uh, you know, there's like a tiny bit of math, and essentially, instead, like most problems in security, in computer security, the crypto breaks because the users and the implementers and the system de designers made some mistake, or they have an incomplete threat model, or they make incorrect assumptions about other components of the system. This happens over and over and over again. It's sort of an integrated system with a small amount of, you know, mathematics and, and technical tools. So one of the central principles in, in constructing secure systems is defense in depth. Um, so that is having multiple layers of different types of protections uh, because we as sort of computer security professionals know that assumptions and constructions fail. You don't want to have just one layer of protection. Um, this implicit layer of laws, human behavior, and economics that we've all been sort of invoking here needs to be included as we think about technical and non-technical defenses against the different threats that we're facing. We need to be wary of blaming technological tools for problems that have deep underlying social and economic causes like terrorism and crime and and all sorts of other terrible things. Um, and we also need to be wary of searching for purely, purely technical, technical solutions to these problems, because these are problems that have no technical solutions. We also need to look out for non-technical side effects of proposed technical solutions that even can make people's lives better. Um, this is sort of particularly in difficult and dangerous when our current legal and policy environment is so opaque. So I think we're all at risk here of, uh, you know, we, we say things of what we know, but there's like a vast, gigantic iceberg underneath of, of, that we barely have any idea about. So with that, I will end. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for those interesting introductory remarks. So encryption and other privacy and security enhancing technologies are of course double-edged swords. All of us can and should use them to protect our data and our online activities, but criminals and terrorists can also use them to protect their data and their online activities from the government agencies that we have charged with catching them. Government officials keep demanding that we that is, the people up here and our research communities do something about this. As I said earlier, they want us to build systems that are secure against the bad guys, but that always allow the good guys whatever access they need to identify and catch and convict the bad guys. So could we actually do that? 
And if we could, should we? No. <laughs> no. So that's no, that's no and no. Okay. Are you, Do you want me to say more than just no? Look, I you, can. I can you, start with you no. people oh, can yeah. say whatever you want. I ask the questions. You're supposed to answer. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, sure, I'll, uh, I'll shoot. Um, I think, uh, so, you know, many people have, uh, have uh, uh, elucidated many good reasons why backdoors are a, a really bad idea in crypto or in... Well, publishing shop. Printing shop. For example, yeah. yes, yes. Or so, in the personal so devices perhaps we you rely should on. Explain right? what a backdoor in okay. the crypto system is, since there are many people in the audience who are not crypto people. Okay. Yeah. So, so we can, in principle, design, and you know, this has been done, design crypto, uh, you know, crypto systems where not only the endpoints, the owners of a you know device, uh, devices that are communicating have the keys, but there's also, uh, has the keys to encrypt and decrypt, but also uh, uh, someone else, uh, an agency, c keeps key, a master key in escrow, such that, uh, such that, for example, a law enforcement agency can, uh, can collect an encrypted ciphertext and, de and use the master key for, for, uh, to decrypt that. And this was a uh, uh, this was a big topic of de debate quite a while ago in what's common, often called the first crypto wars, when uh, uh, when the um, uh, the NSA and the U.S. government was trying to push uh, for the use of a, a crypto standard called Skipjack, uh, embedded in the uh, infamous Clipper chip. Um, uh, and this was a this you know failed uh, at a policy and uh, and commercial marketplace level. Fortunately, but of course the topic we have seen the topic recently come back um, and uh, not uh, it's not really uh, come back in quite the same way uh, now we're uh, we're not seeing a heavy push uh, to uh, to backdoor crypto algorithms per se but we are seeing a renewed push to backdoor personal devices the devices that implement and contain uh, algorithms this is what we saw last year in the uh, Apple versus FBI uh, uh, situation where the FBI was trying to pre pressure Apple to uh, to sign to digital, digitally sign use their special you know uh, uh, software signing key to digitally sign and uh, provide the FBI with a uh, special backdoored uh, version of the Apple iOS software in order to get get into personal devices. Right? So, so uh, that, yeah, that's the kind of the, the High-level background for anyone uh, not familiar. Um, now, you know, there's many. Like I said, there's you know many reasons and many good arguments. I think why uh, these kinds of backdoors, especially in personal devices and, and software, are are um, uh, really problematic. One I mentioned in my uh, in introductory uh, comments, uh, uh, as just on a, a matter of basic principles and human rights. I'm not a constitutional lawyer, so I'm not you know speaking as a lawyer, but just as a uh, uh, I think uh, non-lawyers can and should still take a stand on basic principles, and I think as a, as a matter of basic principles, we need to recognize that there are legitimate warrant-proof spaces. The contents of our mind is a legitimate warrant-proof space, and our le the electronic extensions to our mind have to be included in that as well. Uh, but, but then beyond just matter of principle arguments, uh, in terms of practicalities, uh, one of the problems uh, with backdooring personal devices that move around us is we are so, we as traveling creatures with you know who are supposed to have freedom of move, movement, uh, you can't pin us to a particular jurisdiction. <coughs> we change juris legal jurisdictions as we travel. When we visit another state or another country, the set of law enforcement authorities that in principle would need to have access to any back doors in our devices would have to change. When I, when I go, go, you know, take a trip to France, uh, you know, the U.S. should stop having backdoor access, but the French will, government will say, well, if I commit a crime in France, then they had better have access to that back door. And when I move to another country, the this, this story would be the same. Now, we do not know of a way to create you know, devices that securely 
have, uh, have you know, back doors for every country in the world except for the obvious uh, simple approach of just g giving all countries back doors for, for any of the de devices. And that's where we would end up, with a race to the bottom where every law, uh, 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 so, so our, all of our thoughts and memories are subject to the worst secure, the, the most corrupt government anywhere in the world, and it would be a, a global race to the bottom, and we, we can't, we can't uh, be there. So. so I think it may be, you know, actually, there's, I think territoriality has begun to decline in this respect. I don't know in U.S. law, I can't think of a case in U.S. law, but I believe German ha Germany has a law against sex tour tourism that binds German citizens who might be going to Thailand to have, have sex with underage partners. And so the notion that you, the authority your government had over your widget right, goes away when you go to France, you know, probably the, neither government much believes that. But there's a general problem you're finding here, which is, roughly speaking, you, as you need to be to function, get larger and larger. You need your glasses, you need your laptop, you need your clothes. But you, as a legal entity, get smaller and smaller. And so they can, you know, they can search, search your body with all sorts of techniques they didn't have before. That <clears throat> they're dangerously close to being able to read your mind. So they want to maintain, basically there's nothing, you have no rights that are sort of inherent, but in fact you need more and more things which the state can turn on or off at will. I want to talk a little bit, um, I want to talk a little bit about the technical reasons against backdoors, um, because I mean, I guess this has been a subject of research for me for um, at the past few years. And uh, there, there are some interesting case examples that I want to give to all of you so you have talking points the next time you get into an argument with your family about this. Um, <laughs> so uh, the examples, so um, Brian mentioned the uh, crypto wars of the 1990s and there was the skipjack system. Another sort of technical casualty that came up during the 1990s was uh, export uh, cryptography restrictions for HTTPS, so like the secure, when you're connecting to the web, I guess this is relevant to uh, this year's Turing Award. Um, so when you're connecting to the web, you want to use cryptography. Uh, this, it became clear in the 1990s that, that cryptography was necessary when connecting to the web because if you wanted to do e-commerce, you needed to send your credit card number and people wanted to be able to encrypt your credit card number so it couldn't be stolen over the wire, right? Okay, so it was clear that cryptography was relevant until that point uh, cryptography had been regulated as a munition by the U.S. government, and so was subject to the same kinds of laws as, you know, la missile launchers and, and those kinds of things. Um, these restrictions were lessened slightly so that uh, U.S. companies could implement weakened cryptography and export it, uh, but not export strong cryptography, and, th and there were limits. And so the way that this was dealt with on a technical level in implementing cryptography for the web was that you would have multiple versions of the protocol that could be negotiated if you were speaking to somebody outside of the United States versus if you were speaking to somebody inside of the United States. So you would do a little handshake, your computer would do a handshake and the server would say, okay, you're inside the US, we'll speak strong crypto. Oh, you're outside the US, we'll speak weak crypto. This is an example, I guess, it's not quite a back door, it was clear what was happening. This is like a front door. And the, the key sizes were, uh, you know, picked so that they were presumably breakable by the NSA at that time. So 40-bit symmetric keys, then 56-bit symmetric keys, 512-bit uh, RSA and Diffie-Hellman keys, since we have some of A and D and H in the room. Um, <laughs> this is relevant. So um, this is, you know, so weak crypto for everybody outside the U.S., strong crypto inside the U.S. Sounds good, reasonable. At a technical level, it's not that bad of an idea, I guess, you know, kind of setting the evil bit for your... Uh, TCP packets is similar, you know, you can choose to like use weak crypto if you want. Most users don't know the difference. Okay, so this is the way it was sort of implemented. In around the year 2000, these export restrictions <coughs> were lifted for open source and com like widely available commercial software. So most people sort of consider them not to be relevant anymore. And people just sort of forgot that this option existed in your web crypto. Um, fast forward to 2015, we have multiple versions later you know, the, the web has exploded, it's turned on all, all, you know, it's revolutionized the world. This export crypto didn't go away. 
something like a third of web servers still were willing to speak weakened crypto with somebody who asked for it because there was no reason to turn it off. Why would you want to lose customers who <coughs> wanted to visit your website using some like 1996 version of Netscape Navigator or something? You know, um, There are good reasons why people didn't bother to turn it off. Backwards compatibility is important. So, okay, whatever. Weak crypto for people who are using weak browsers, strong crypto for everybody else, except that um, in addition to like this crypto being weak, it turns out that the protocols were flawed in the first place because people made mistakes in designing the protocols. So there were implementation flaws in the, um, in the uh, browser implementations. There were protocol flaws and then you know, using the vast explosion in computing technology, what was breakable by the NSA presumably in 1996 is breakable by anybody in 2015. So this combination of, of factors meant that like, um, I and a large number of co-authors over a whole series of papers uh, discovered that there were serious flaws affecting every single web browser now. Who, people who thought that they were using modern crypto with fully up-to-date implementations on both sides were severely compromised by the fact that the crypto export laws 20 years ago were asking for a front door. So that's one example. Um, another example is I mentioned possible backdoor uh, crypto standards. Um, the keyword is the dual ECDRBG, for those of you who've heard the word. This is a random number generator that was standardized by um, NIST and ISO um, and sort of placed into these standards. Um, as far as we know, suggested by articles about the Snowden documents, it appears that the NSA built a backdoor into the standard so that they could uh, predict future outputs and, and steal the keys of anybody who was using this random number generator. This is the, I'm waving my hands. Um, this was uh, fine, you know, there, there were some default parameters that were built into the standard. Um, if you didn't use those default parameters, you should have been fine. There, however, in, I think it was late 2015, there was an interesting security advisory put out by Juniper, so they make networking hardware. Um, that they discovered some unauthorized code in um, one of their products, and the unauthorized code was in their implementation of this random number generator. They'd used different parameters because they'd already sort of heard about the, the risk of the default parameters, and somebody had gotten access to their source code repository, it's not clear how, and changed the parameters to different parameters. And since they had, whoever made this change presumably knew the relationship between the parameters, they were able to exploit this backdoor um, random number generator on, the, like, on their own. So this is an example of a government introduced backdoor that should have been theoretically perfect. Only somebody who has the secret key could exploit the backdoor. Somebody else figured out how to exploit the backdoor against a concrete implementation. Um, so a few other sort of non-cryptographic examples that you can bring home with your family. Um, there was, uh, so these, we've had, we, basically most telecommunication systems have uh, systems for exceptional access for law enforcement. Um, these systems uh, have been used over and over again by hackers because they are often the easiest way into the system. So an example is the Greek wiretapping scandal. Um, this is a, 10 years ago. Um, during the Olympics, it appears that um, Greek telecom systems included uh, law enforcement, exceptional access um, for increased security around the Olympics, um, and then some unknown attackers exploited this system to uh, wiretap a large number of politicians. Uh, when Google China was hacked in several years ago, um, the attackers went in through the law enforcement access capability. So we see this over and over and over again that the backdoor actually backdoors are actually being exploitable exploited by um, attackers who are not the intended recipients of the backdoor. It's like stealing the drugs from the evidence room, <laughs> right? The police conveniently gathered, you know, tons of dope in one place, and somebody thought it needed to be marketed. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, I so just very quickly, I just to sum up quickly. and sort of put the forest on all these trees. I think the 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 point which Nadia so nicely illustrated with all these examples is that I know of nobody in this space who has um, uh, described a system that has these sorts of properties that doesn't end up within a fairly short amount of time being completely broken and then used, used to do against. bad things against 
the good guys, as we put it. And this just happens over and over again. And uh, um, I think that this is a lesson that you know, we understand, but that I think that the people who uh, want to do their investigations and the policymakers don't seem to understand. Um, I, I think this is best summed up by a, a quote uh, from uh, Matt Blaze, who said that uh, they seem to say, well, you can put a man on the moon, surely you can put a man on the sun. And you know, we, <laughs> that they don't seem to it's realize that the, this is what they are the asking for. back safely that the <laughs> right, <yeah. so. laughs> part of the original. Okay, so. Um, I think you've uh, convinced everyone, I hope, that uh, back doors are a bad idea, both on, from the point of view of constitutional rights and from the point of view that um, they don't work. <laughs> so uh, what, if anything, can and should our communities do to help law enforcement and intelligence in their quest to identify and catch bad guys online? So there's a a couple of things we could do. I mean, I'm sure Brian has already alluded to some of the things uh, for looking at, um, well, I'll let you talk about that. But, but one thing that I think also comes out of all these sort of backdoors and stuff is to look at all the systems and realize that it's not just the investigators who want to figure out what's going on. The, the, the miscreants want to as well. So look at how communication is done online. Look at the routing of of information, look at the cell towers, and re recognize that the more data that's there, the more the uh, the more surface area you have, the more risk you have for for everybody. And um, you know, Witt talked about this in his open remarks about about the exposure of you know s national infrastructure. So the more we can design systems so that you can do more with less, that you can route phone calls without. Uh, having to know specifically they can get there and they can be billed and all that. But we can do the crypto to, to, uh, to make it so that that is, uh, um, doesn't have to reveal nearly as much information as we now do. So designing systems like that is one of the things that we can do. Yeah, so I'll, I'll follow up. I, so to venture into territory that I, I suspect my uh, distinguished colleague might, uh, might uh, uh, more, be more likely to disagree with me on. I think there are cases where where uh, where it can make sense to uh, to design in uh, uh, into certain systems some kind of exceptional access mechanisms, as uh, as Nadia uh, discussed, that would that uh, that would in principle aid uh, uh, you know could serve law enforcement uh, 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 purposes under the right uh, principles, but. Um, and you know, Joan and I and others have done uh, some research into this space. Um, uh, but it's really, I, I think it's really important to distinguish uh, several different scenarios. One, one is, you know, for, for personal devices, uh, you know, kind of the, the extensions to ourselves, I don't think any kind of backdoor, uh, you know, or, or law, uh, you know, law enforcement access, uh, you know, is, is a workable argument. Uh, on the other hand, a, a different set of considerations comes into play when we talk about cell tower dumps, business records held by third parties. You know, it, what are the ways uh, a law enforcement or surveillance agency can ask our neighbors or uh, you know for phone records, our ISPs, uh, our cloud providers for records about us? And and here, uh, uh, the the current state of the art is. You know, law enforcement comes with a uh, with a warrant or a, even a non a non warrant uh, uh, sub uh, sub buena based on weaker um, uh, evidence, uh, and just sa says, you know, uh, give me all these uh, you know thousands uh, th these cell tower dumps that have information about thousands of people, uh, in them, most of whom are certainly innocent, right? And uh, and this is just handed over in clear text with no privacy protection whatsoever. Uh, and uh, uh, and so in this kind of, these kinds of situations, there's actually an opportunity to get both much better security and much better privacy for everyone by working uh, on a public basis uh, to develop public uh, transparent mechanisms to support some of the uh, some of the at least some of the most common case needs of uh, uh, of law law enforcement for proven uh, for proven. Um, 
uh, law enforcement techniques like taking the you know cell tower dumps, uh, phone records from several uh, uh, different cell towers at sites where uh, criminal activity was known to have, have occurred, for example, and intersect them, find the, you know, if there was a criminal who's who was using their cell phone at, you know, each of several uh, criminal activity, uh, you know, sites of cr criminal activity, find that person, that one un unknown phone number, and reveal that without, uh, w without compromising the privacy of all the other 150,000 uh, 50, people who were around those areas at those times. Um, we know how to do that. We have algorithms uh, and technologies can do that, but they need to be uh, developed and, and, uh, and deployed in, first of all, a transparent fashion. So this has to be public law, public, public processes, not secret law and secret processes. It has to embody separation of powers. I, I want to make sure that it's not just one three-letter agency that controls everything, but really, you know, for real, the, the you know, representatives of the judiciary and the, uh, and the legislative uh, branches are hooked into that and can, can ensure that, uh, that uh, these technologies aren't misused. Um, and uh, so, so I think there is a legitimate space for that. And I think it's, uh, it's um, I think that can be uh, made attractive to law enforcement as well, because currently they're, they're relying on a lot of secret technologies to, uh, to uh, uh, and uh, in doing so they get evidence that gets, that's hard to use in courts, right? They're getting their, prosecutors are getting their cases thrown out of court uh, uh, regularly because either the judge or, or other, uh, other people object to the way the evidence, the secret ways the evidence was gathered. Law enforcement is worried about losing its tools, legitimately so. We could give them transparent tools that, uh, that they can be sure are not going to disappear tomorrow. And, uh, 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 and um, they're, also, they're also having to uh, um, get the, uh, having to um, pull their cases from courts, having to just uh, prosecutors are just having to withdraw legitimate pr um, prosecutions against real criminals or terrorists just in order to keep, because the judge has demanded to see uh, uh, the details of the technology use it, used to gather the evidence, and the prosecutors are saying, you know, we can't do that, so it's better to let the terrorists go than to reveal the secrets of this technology. So we're already, uh, you know, compromising the effectiveness of investigations in order to keep these secrets secrets. This is not how either democracy or law enforcement should work, right? And uh, so we should, we can and should, you know, provide transparent alternatives. Okay, I, I'll just agree with that. Thank you. Um, so uh, I think um, it's an appealing idea to like use fancy crypto um, to do fancy things and, and increase privacy. I'm very worried from the sort of interaction between the policy and, and technical aspects that um, first sort of the legal system and the people involved in the legal system, the lawyers and the judges and the juries aren't, and, and our politicians are not technical people, they don't understand the difference between um, what's involved in um, these kinds of tools. Oh, you can do this one magic thing? Well, surely you can build this other magic backdoor into the Apple iPhone. Um, and from a, from a technical perspective, I think the crypto involved is not so different between if you're thinking about using, say, secure multi-party computation to um, do some kind of like private center intersection. Okay, well, you could also use uh, searchable encryption to build a um, nice, secure, um, backdoored, uh, searchable encryption system for an iPhone that like every, every message that you sent would be, you know, happily encrypted to say a secret shared set of, of keys between, I don't know, the um, British police and the US police and, and the FBI and the NSA and everybody would have to come together in order to search for uh, messages about terrorism. You could do that using fancy crypto that we know how to do today and, and it, it's actually like on the border of being efficient enough to be deployable now. And this is not so distinguishable like technically from um, the sort of larger like business records case that you're discussing. So I'm worried about this sort of slippery slope um, of that. Yep. 
I am also, you know, to, to respond to that, I, I am also very worried about slippery slopes like this, and I completely agree that there is an enormous uh, gap in understanding between the technology communities and the policy communities. But I don't agree that that means we should retreat into our technology holes, try to, try to kind of develop technology from a you know, kind of policy, uh, you know, devoid of policy and treat it as, as a policy neutral, as a set of policy neutral tools, which it is not anyway, right? We can't avoid the fact that technology is not policy neutral. Instead, the solution is to, uh, is to uh, address this, this gap of understanding. We need to talk to policy people more and find ways to get them to talk to us more and figure out how to close this gap of understanding. I agree that we should all talk more. This is, <laughs> so this is um, a very, very often, um, very often uh, argued about point of disagreement in the crypto and security community. Should we say they, that is to say law, government agencies, are right now accessing a ton of plain text data, either with or without warrants. Let's assume for the best case it's with warrants. We, crypto and security researchers, have protocols, have tools that would allow them to perform the same operations with warrants on encrypted data and wind up only in decrypting the specific records that it turns out they need and protecting the rest of the records of innocent bystanders, bystanders that happen to wind up in that cell tower dump or whatever other huge set of data they got. Some of us are really raring to go ahead and do that and deploy these techniques. And some people say, no, don't do that. You'll just give them bad ideas. They'll just go on believing that you are magicians and you can give them ways to access whatever they want and not be subject to accusations of violating anyone's privacy. I don't have a solution, just wanted to make sure you saw what the conflict is, because it's a pervasive conflict. Okay, so this is the last question that comes from us, and then I'll be asking your questions. So um, I think many, many people have sort of pointed out that um, this research into security and privacy and cryptography, this is hardly new, right here in this room, in fact, right on this stage, we have a number of Turing Award winners who have explicitly been given their awards for crypto and security, and others like uh, Rabin and like Butler Lampson, who um, maybe that wasn't what they got the award for, but they've also done a tremendous amount of work in crypto and security. Okay, so this is hardly a new field. There's been decades of effort that has already produced many effective technologies why aren't these technologies in more widespread use? Why do we have something like the DNC hack of John Podesta's email that you know, would have been prevented had he been using two-factor authentication, which was available you know, 30 years ago, 40 years ago? I mean, it's not a new idea. And you know, even Yale uses two-factor authentication. It's not, it's not, an, it's not, it's not exotic protocol. Ah, uh, but the skull and bones of the <laughs> You'll have to ask them, though. Um, yeah, no, I don't, I don't know. What, why, why, given the amount of knowledge that there is about this subject already, do we always seem to start every session about it that is given to a mixed audience by saying, well, well we don't really know. anybody does, we find some fault with it. I mean, TLS is probably the most widely distributed crypto-based security system ever seen in the world. Lots of this is in use. The problem is we don't know how to build good computer programs, and op op the, the, opponents, you know, <clears throat> the opponents are another set of programmers trying to debug your program for, with different objectives. And so the whole model of what it means to get a program debugged, which is pretty much avoiding random errors, avoiding most of the errors, et cetera, doesn't work at all against an opposing team that's trying to find any one error that will serve its purposes. One thing is that even though this technology may have been out there forever, I think Witt sort of hit on it because I think 
to a large extent uh, to, as computing technologies get transitioned into, into businesses and, and places like this, um, there is perhaps a, a desire to make things that are you know, fault tolerant and, and so on. But the notion that you have to build in from the get-go uh, the idea of an adversary, that that has to be part of the design of everything from the beginning, I, I think security people understand that, that, you know, that security is defined in some sense by understanding your adversary model, but having that built into the design is not, I think, part of, of uh, you know, business process or development process as, as it exists. Um, so I think that's a, a missing piece. Okay. Yeah, I, I think to, to add to that, I think uh, you know, Bruce Schneier and others have observed that the, uh, the market for cybersecurity or security products in general tends to behave as a lemon market. I mean, if, if there's a, you know, a, a, a um, uh, principle that that a, uh, a Nobel Nobel laureate uh, came up with that uh, uh, that uh, in a market in which the sellers uh, have a lot more information about a product, uh, the quality of a product than the buyers, uh, that tends to incentivize a reduction uh, in in the in quality to the uh, uh, you know to a least common denominator, uh, basically producing lemons uh, like like lemon automobiles, but. A, uh, also, lemon secure, you know, you know, lemons in terms of security properties. Mm, the lemon, so lemon router. Exactly, the lemon router. Yeah, <laughs> and um, <laughs> and unfortunately, the uh, you know, um, this is clearly a market I market incentive issue as well. There aren't enough incentives for manufacturers of devices and software to put invest the time and effort to verifying their software, even if it's just TLS, for example. Or you know to really debug it from an adversarial perspective. Or updating perspective. the browsers from the ones the that browsers. they installed yeah, yeah. in 1996. Yeah. Now you know in in some parts of the world we are seeing those some of those incentives gradually raising. For example, your Europe is, has introduced this uh, general data protection rate regulation that increases the penalties to businesses to uh, uh, for data breaches to in some cases 4% of the uh, gross uh, pr uh, uh, product of the, uh, of the company. That's, that's you know, you, you, if you're a company, you get hit by that. And they, they will be happy to hit any company anywhere in the world, not just companies based in Europe. So this actually does, you know, will add some incentive to invest more, which is great. So there are some promising developments, but they're not enough. Okay, so I think we have to ask some questions from the <laughs> audience. Here's a good one. I recently became an advisor to an organization that deals with the nuclear security of the United States. The organization is quite worried because a cyber breach could end life on Earth as we know it. So Witt actually mentioned this, the cyber physical barrier and the, the, the great vulnerability there, which is relatively new. What should I advise them about this issue? <laughs> Well, I have the feeling that that narrow worry might be better addressed than, the, than some of these other things. You know, there's a movie years ago, gosh, about two kids who break into the nuclear command and control War system. Games. War games, <laughs> right? And I'm, I'm pretty confident that exactly what is going on there, which goes on lots of other places, is not done in that particular network. Namely, it was being used for research side by side with being used for operations, and that produced a path into it. So I think that network is probably isolated enough that it's unlikely to be broken into when somebody launch all the missiles, though, you know, it was a 4th of July hack. That, um, but <clears throat> I think that the, the ones that are commercially driven look at the situation we have such and such, you know, generators, power distribution, et cetera, we can save money on communications by connecting it all through the internet, right? Those are the ones that I think are giving us a very unstable system that might well be broken into with disastrous consequences. In, indeed, beware of the internet of things, especially. Uh, as we have seen, you know, not long ago, in in the case of the, I think it was the Mirai botnet that was mainly, you know, a, a large collection of, you know, insecure web webcams and other 
Internet of Things devices that basically got turned in a, into a botnet uh, big enough to take down much of the Internet for, for some number of hours. Uh, and, uh, you know, and this, uh, this kind of underlines kind of the, the power of this kind of, you know, especially commodity hardware developed without, you know, market incentives to secure it properly. Uh, and you know that's a that's a huge uh, huge threat to uh, to I think global security. ACM has several roles to play in this debate, including the ongoing revision to the ACM Code of Ethics and U.S. ACM and EU ACM position papers on the topic. What other activities can or should ACM be taking as an organization? recognizing the multinational aspect of our membership. I think there's space for, inf I, one thing that I think is, well, how do I phrase this properly? Um, I'm hesitant to advocate for increased regulation of computer security, but it seems like it's starting to become necessary. Um, and I think we can look back uh, particularly at um, changes in the way in automobile security in the United States, right? So, you know, um, automobile security increased massively starting several decades ago with a big focus on con consumer safety and regulation and careful testing. And that is something that is not present in a lot of um, safety critical systems now that are being connected to the internet. So I think a a wise and slow and carefully considered process that is influenced very deeply at a technical level um, across multiple governments in trying to produce sane um, computer and network security standards for products is necessary and an organization like the ACM would be able to bring experts um, who would help influence that process and convince the government. There are a few branches of government, the FTC has started um, looking into, uh, you know, um, suing companies for, uh, you know, negligence in cases of um, when, they, when they've been breached due to, like, serious negligence. Um, but I think sort of bringing up the general level of, of safety standards is important. What is true security? Security. What would your personal ideal world of security look like? How can we reframe the false dichotomy of privacy and security so that we can have a discussion about the value of privacy and security? Well, so as I already said, I think if you're looking at things from a technology perspective, there's no distinction. I mean, I have a, I have a slide from one of my talks where there's a bunch of people, there's a, a abuse victim survivor accessing the you know, system trying to, and there's a law enforcement person, and there's a business guy, and they're all touching this elephant and you know, saying, oh, it's, you know, it's privacy, it's security, it's, it's you know, uh, intrusion resistance, and, and it's all the same thing. Uh, you can, the, the use of it in society, we may label as privacy or security, but on a technical level, what you're trying to do is is uh, manage you know, which bits get to be where and who gets to look at them in, in, a, in a controlled uh, way. So Security um, is analogous maybe to health in that uh, you can think of being healthy as the absence of being sick. And security has a similar problem in that um, security can be the absence of not having been hacked or violated um, and if you think about it that way, then yeah, right, one thing, of, this is absolute, yeah, it's, it's sort of a negative definition, which is, is problematic. Yeah, one thing I, I would, there wasn't quite stated in that question, but the notion that there's some true security out there, there's this tendency a lot of times you get this question, well, is this secure? And uh, you know, anybody who works in the field will say, is it secure against what sort of adversary in what sort of application environment, for what period of time, protecting what kind of data, and just asking is it secure or not is not actually a meaningful question. I mean, that, uh, to continue with the health analogy, that would be yeah. you know, like taking a normal human being with some mix of things, and yeah, you could say, well, he's healthy, but then you could say, well, what about, um, you know, has this been tested and that been tested? And, 
and it's not a, just a single simple answer. And what is security defense? Very much how you look at things. Right? People ask, you know, do I worry because I do online banking that I might get broken into? Well, maybe, but overall my financial security has improved dramatically because now I get my bills paid and my creditors aren't mad at me. Right? <laughs> and so large, you know, larger and smaller issues. Okay, so I guess um, what is true security is actually a very contextually determined and complex question. And I think one of the problems that our community has is um, we do have very strict standards. For, we do have very uh, demanding definitions of security and privacy. We allow for negligible error rates. And that may be unrealistic. I mean, that may not actually be the way human systems work. There may be a lot more tolerance for various security problems, various uh, breaches of private data than our framework, than our intellectual framework really take, really acknowledges. But those are also, those are, those sorts of very narrow requirements are usually for effectively the security building blocks. You have an algorithm which is, you know, probabilistic polynomial right. times secure against this or that. But what we're talking about is, you know, like, you, like uh, Witt said, you know, I'm trying to do my banking online. Right. And the question isn't, you know, that of, about the, the, the underlying algorithm. I mean, that is a question, but it's also about right. how it's all getting put together. And, and I there, think that is one answer to this question of how can we reframe the discussion so that it's a discussion about the true value of privacy and security. I think it has to be a discussion about the true actual human enterprise that you're trying to have privacy or security in, which may not require the kind of perfect software that we're never going to have, right? I'm not so. sure. But I also need to work in liability, I think. Yes. Right? This is a bizarre business in the WannaCry malware of a couple of weeks ago. And Microsoft said it didn't release a patch for this, right, because it wasn't maintaining the system anymore. Mm -hmm. And it was really weird. Can you imagine a car company saying, you know, we discovered the tie rods tend to become brittle after 20 years, and, but we're not maintaining that model anymore. We didn't issue a recall. Mm -hmm. I think that's very unlikely, and I think something needs to be I, is done. Is that really I true? I mean, if you, riot, you know, got your Packard. I don't know the answer. I don't I mean, know the answer for sure. So okay, I, I said I, I consider, would consider it surprising, but okay, I think, so I've been surprised one more question. before. So can I can I just add one uh, one more thing to that? So I, I think quickly. yeah yeah. So I, I think this uh, underlines uh, an important uh, observation that uh, even Moglen at uh, Columbia made that security and privacy are not individual problems; they're environmental problems. Your security and everybody else's security, and the security of all of the devices in the environment are just as critical as what I, I individually do, and we have to address it as an environmental problem. Okay. Like anonymity, security so, likes Like company. anonymity. <laughs> so, today's approaches <laughs> to security and privacy often involve searching for needles in haystacks. Are there architectural artifacts? There's a legibility problem here. I think it's artifacts. Are there architectural <laughs> artifacts that build on internet, build on intent, that build on intent to manage, um, to manage information uh, that will help here. So I can't really read this question, but I think that the gist of it is that um, perhaps there are infrastructural properties. You know, we're stuck with a particular information infrastructure that isn't all that privacy friendly and that isn't all that security friendly. Are there infrastructural principles that we can keep in mind? Because infrastructure evolves. You know, are there things we can do that will help sort of improve things system-wide rather than have us continuing to put our fingers in dikes and to find needles in haystacks? Well, I would, similar to what I said before, I mean, having adversary models be part of, you know, part and parcel. I'm going to design this system, and one of the first questions being, well, who might try to break into this and how, and what might they be able to do in 10, 15 years that they can't yeah. do now? 
and, and, and what sort of defense and depth do I have against that? And I'm sure there's going to be all kinds of difficulties because you know, people have finite budgets and, and uh, they might choose not to, to pursue certain things, but at least if they do it with eyes open because this is built into the process from the start as opposed to attempting to U-bolt the security on uh, you know, after the fact. Uh, I think that's a, a, a one piece of that. Yes. I think I think some of the most fundamental principles we need to figure out how to embody in, in our security systems are derived directly from centuries old policy principles of rule of law, i.e. transparency and processes, as well as things like separation of powers. We need to design systems that actually embody these and are connected to po policy and and uh, and and actually implement those uh, those principles. Well, I kind of think that you know, if we spent all, if we devoted the money that's currently devoted to anti-malware and basically sort of interactive defense and paying for protection to solving the fundamental problems, we might actually get done. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Well, that certainly gives us something to lose sleep over, or at the very least, think about. Um, our thanks to the panel for that incredibly provocative presentation, so ably chaired by Joan Feigenbaum. Thank you very much, guys, again.